My name is Rick Gugliotti and I have a problem. I'd like to introduce you to the problem because I believe it's a problem for you too. Good evening, bonsoir and welcome to the virtual press conference of the International uh, Agency for Research on Cancer. My name is Nicolas Godin and I'm the head of communications for IARC here in Lyon. The uh, working group has been meeting to assess the carcinogenic hazards associated with exposure to radio frequency electromagnetic fields and has just finished their evaluations. I'm pleased to have with me here in the IARC studios Dr. Jonathan Samet. Thank you. And I'll hand over to Dr. John Samet. Thank you and uh, good evening. I'm going to briefly summarize uh, the work of a group of 31 uh, international scientists carried out over the uh, last uh, eight days here in uh, Lyon. The uh, working group uh, classified radio frequency electromagnetic fields as possibly carcinogenic to humans. The nature of the, these fields as they come from various uh, devices including uh, wireless phones. Uh, so I think with that um, summary I'll uh, turn things back to uh, you and your questions. Thank you Dr. Sennett. Uh, next, Jeff Waters from Australian Broadcasting. There hasn't been any mention so far, as far as I've heard, of uh, telephone towers, mobile telephone towers and their effects on human health. Should we conclude that mobile telephone towers are also included in the possible risk? The designation uh, of for two, Group 2B is radio frequency electromagnetic fields. That is unspecified as to source, so the Group 2B classification would have broad applicability to sources with this type of emissions. This is an Apple iPhone. Let's use our radio frequency meters to measure the microwave radiation coming off of this iPhone. It's averaging about 15,000 microwatts per square meter at a distance of approximately one to two inches. Okay, the reason we're told not to hold the cell phone next to our head is because it's constantly emitting microwave radiation. And as you move it away, you can see the level goes down. If you live within a few hundred meters of these cell phone antennas, you are exposed to constant microwave radio frequency radiation. And this is 11,000 microwatts per meter squared. This is a long-term care facility and on the grounds we have a cell phone antenna disguised as a flagpole. Here we have more than 5,000 microwatts per meter squared. My name is Rick Gugliotti. I'm a uh, owner of a property right here uh, on Balsam Drive and uh, next door to me is the Bell Center. This transmitter that they put up there is about 20 meters away from my bedroom, uh, which is just up here. And uh, my kids' bedroom is just, just over here, and uh, they're exposed to this radiation uh, all night when they sleep. So th this location um, being uh, the closest proximity to the transmitter, um, we're going to see the highest readings here. So we're, we're getting readings between uh, you know, five and 8,000 microwatts per square meter. And um, the exposure in this bedroom would be the highest um, of the whole home, I, I would imagine. This uh, house was built for the safety of my children and my wife and my family, and uh, I don't believe I'm safe here. Dr. Jennifer Armstrong specializes in environmental medicine. The big thing with kids is they're more vulnerable. Why? Children are more vulnerable. Their skulls are thinner. Their, their bodies are not um, as strong as ours in, in general. They're developing, their brains are developing. So you expose children to radiation and their little bodies don't handle it as well. And cardiologist Dr. Stephen Sinatra agrees. 
as a parent, if I had a young child, would I want to use my child as an experiment to see if it's going to take 30 years or 20 years or 10 years to become sick? No, not me. If anything, um, I think maybe microwave radiation is going to show up to be much more harmful than smoking simply because of the amount of exposure that we're, we're seeing in our everyday environment. So how about the people who make these products? It's like being cooked. You know, you, you, you get it, it. It's like laying on the beach for too long. That feeling that you know your eyes are all dried out, and your ears ring, and your fillings. If you got metal fillings, you can taste. You can actually taste the RF when you're up there. It tastes metallic. And the longest I've ever spent on the tower is 16 hours, and I totally fried myself. This is one woman's experience of living on the top floor under cell antennas for two months. Um, it started with my daughter. She initially got a rash on her leg that was sort of unexplainable. Some more of the symptoms include uh, a sort of hissing in my ear, um, in particular when I'm in my apartment, but for about three days, anywhere I went, it would just sort of come in. I kind of felt like an antenna and I'd sort of kind of go like <laughs> trying to find the place where the, the hissing or the buzzing stopped. But now, when, wherever I go, I'm feeling the same as I felt in my apartment, feeling dizzy and nauseous and a sort of a metallic taste in my mouth, um, headache and pressure on my head and just feeling like I want to sort of faint or, or throw up. And that's wherever I go now. Dr. David Carpenter is a world-renowned expert in environmental toxins in Albany, New York. And he says the Canadian government is just plain wrong. What we do is look at the weight of the evidence. But that's what they said they did. They didn't. The weight of the evidence demonstrates clearly that exposure to radio frequency radiation the causes disease the evidence is strongest for cancer you know yes while people need their cell phone service that's absolutely true they don't need to go outside someone's window they don't need to go across a school they don't need to go in places like that where you're really potentially putting the public at risk in my judgment we are sitting on a ticking bomb and we're not doing what we should do to advise people on ways that they can reduce their exposure, to tell them that they should reduce their exposure, that they should just be aware of this threat. You know, I, I sincerely hope it's not as bad as I think it is. But my job as a public health official is to do what I can to prevent disease, not wait till people develop their brain tumor and then find ways of, of treating it. And I think that the evidence at present calls for an active, urgent message to the public, to the politicians, to the companies, that we must find ways of reducing exposure to radio frequency fields. We have a massive human experiment of people that have been exposed to something that probably is going to result in increased risk of these cancers. And we won't know for another five or ten years how serious this is. In my judgment, the evidence right now is sufficient to say that we should be very cautious and from a public health perspective, this is a very serious issue. So what is actually, people always ask, well, what is the bottom line? Well, the bottom line is that we really need biologically based precautionary standards. They really, People have to look at the biology that is now known and make adjustments to what we consider safe, a safe level. And we gave values in the Bioinitiative report, and I put down the values here. You see basically the values that we recommend as target values are micro as opposed to milli, a factor of approximately a thousand. Health Canada sets the limit at 10 million microwatts per meter squared. Now, that might not mean much to most of us, but in 2008, Toronto's Board of Health said it's way too high and asked Canada's Minister of Health in this letter for much stricter regulations, a hundred times more strict. Health Canada never changed a thing. So you're saying that their science is faulty or their analysis of the science is faulty? Their science is faulty. And certainly their analysis is faulty. Why choose to ignore that? How does that possibly benefit them? When you acknowledge you have a problem and you're a government agency, you have to do something about it. This is a very serious issue of which we don't have the answers and we're not doing anything about it, not even studying it. In the United States today, there is not one study going on. Zero.